sorry uh yes resistance with uh, more than 31 percent uh is uh, is uh, has been observed with the clopidogrel and uh so that uh, that problem uh like cop up with the presugeril and the ticagron the trintron demi approved the drug presugeril which showed there is a huge mortality benefit when it compared with the clopidogrel which is very visible in this graph and then uh, but the problem was presugeril is was the bleeding which uh, as as this graph shows that the demi major bleed life threatening and the non fatal bleeding were more in the presugeril group than in the clopidogrel which was shown in the trintron demi and there was another problem with that uh, with the presugeril that was uh, that the uh, you cannot use because the data was very weak uh, in the group in the in the, in the subgroup of the people such as uh, who had a stroke and tia previously and uh, whose age was more than 75 and the weight was uh, le uh, less than 60 kg uh So yes, uh, sorry. Yes, and now uh, and and another drug. Uh, uh, you know that, that this was ticagrelol. This this uh, is an a revolution. This is a revolutionary drug. Why? Because it is an oral reversible uh, P2Y12 antagonist. This is the only oral reversible P2Y12 antagonist. And the and the major benefit with of this drug was that it does not require metabolic activation and it completely uh, inhibit the P2Y12 re uh, receptors. So the plateau trial came up with the uh, like a, a very good data with that that there was again huge mortality benefit uh, uh, when it compared with the clopidogrel in the plateau trial. It was the trial which was done on the AC in the ACS patient uh, around 18,000 ACS, uh, ACS patients, and uh, it also shown that uh, uh, that um, in, uh, it decreases the uh, risk of myocardial infarction and the cardiovascular death in the patients uh, who were studied in the plateau trial. The, 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 there was a subarm of the STACS plateau trial. It, it again showed the mortality benefit when it compared with the clopidogrel drug. But the problem was that uh, that the non-cabbage TME uh, major bleeding or the minor bleeding both were like uh, more in uh, 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 Ticagrelol group. Otherwise, the uh, cabbage-related bleeding was more in clopidogrel. So uh, there, there was an idea came up that if your patient is going towards the uh, like cabbage or you have plant, so it is better to give the ticagrelol before it, and you have to hold it obviously five days before if you are planning for the cabbage in your patient. The side effect of the ticagrelol obviously it is notorious to cause the ventricular pauses and the dyspnea, but these symptoms are not related to stoppage of the drug. You cannot stop the drug because of these symptoms. And uh, then the question arises, why Tika causes bradycardia? Because it is antiplatelet, but obviously when, they, when, when uh, it, uh, their action, uh, their, their mechanism of action is, uh, uh, is with the, uh, related with adenosine. It increases the adenosine in your blood level, so it causes the vagal C fibers and causing brady and the bronchoconstriction. But here's some good news as well. It increases the ventricular uh, pauses. Obviously, it is not a good news, but it decreases the infarct size and the, um, and the contractility, and it gives benefit in the patients of MI. The, uh, and uh, the only uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, IV uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, has been approved by the Champion Phoenix trial. And uh, again, it showed that uh, clopidogrel was not superior, but, uh, but the canagrel was superior to the clopidogrel in the Champion Phoenix trial. Hence, it has been again approved to use in the, uh, like, have FDA approved in US to use in your patient, in which you have to achieve uh, P2Y12 inhibition in very short time because its action of uh, onset of action is very rapid here uh, wait. so he here are the wait 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 Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, there was a trial which was a compare crush trial because of a school of thought was that if you use the uh, crushed procedural, uh, are, are you guys hearing me? Huda? Yes, yes, yes we are. Anavi. 
Uh, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there was a school of thought that uh, when you use the crushed tablet like presugeril, uh, it it would be more benefited uh, in the ACS group. So it was it was negated by a compare crushed trial which recently came in 2020. There was a trial which was a revolutionary trial in which the head to head comparison of the ticagrel and presugeril was done in the ISA React five trial. So in 2019, it came up with an idea that uh, presugeril was superior to the Ticagrelol in the acute coronary syndromes, uh, but as you know that our gui uh, uh, the guidelines of AHA we have uh, are like uh, 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 are a bit older, and it came into 2013 with the uh, bit uh, modification. So still the, the the class one drug or the P2 white wall inhibitors are clopidogrel, like the loading dose is 600 presugeril 60 mg in the ticagrelol 180 mg. And the maintenance of the P2 white pearl inhibitor in clopidogrel is 75, presurgeal is 10 mg OD, and the ticket roller 90 mg twice a day. So uh, anticoagulants to support the primary PCI, there was the one year, uh, there was a, a, a comparison of bivalutin alone and the heparin with GP2B3A inhibitors in Horizon AMI, and it showed that the, uh, th those group who have uh, done uh, who has been used with the heparin and the GP2B3 inhibitor was uh, better, uh, no, sorry, was not better than the bivalurudine alone. So th this was the trial which actually came up with the idea to usage of the bivalurudine. And then the, there was a meta-analysis who was, which was done on the bivalurudine and it showed that uh, in all major adverse cardiovascular event, the heparin was favorable than the uh, bivalurudine. Uh, but the, uh, as as we know that the stent thrombosis in the primary PCI or the PCS, the stent thrombosis is the major, major, major problem which we have we, we have been facing for the decades. And that the data showed that in the acute stent thrombosis, like in the Horizon MI, Euromax, in the heat primary PCI, it showed that the heparin was favorable. However, the subacute stent thrombosis, the both of the like uh, heparin and the bivalurin were non-inferior. And the uh, obviously in the terms of bleeding, bivalurin was always superior to the heparin because you know that the, with the heparin, there were the chances of the bleeding were more than the bivalurin. And uh, there and, and other uh, uh, like uh, trial came up with the idea of fundiparinox that was the OSS 6. It showed that yes, it was better than in so many conditions. But there was a major problem was the catheter thrombosis in OS66, which came up uh, with an idea that fundaprinox should not be used with the primary PCI as a sole anticoagulant agent. You need to use another anticoagulant agent uh, if you have been you, uh, if you have used the fundaprinox in your patients. So again, uh, but the guidelines say that all these things like the bivalurin, unfractioned heparin, fundaprinox, and this. Uh, enoxaprine are the class one. However, fundaprinox should not be used as a sole anticoagulant agent to support your primary PCI. And the antiplatelet therapy, like the IV antiplatelet therapy, these the, all are the class two A if there is in the selected patient. And the, those were the selected patients of those patients who have the high thrombus burden, number one. Number two, who have the inadequate P2I12 inhibitor. And number three was uh, those who had uh, who, uh, who has slow flow or no flow phenomenon during PCIs. So I think you guys are with me. If you are, if you don't want to be wake up in the next semester, so wake up in my class. Preferred route of uh, for <laughs> primary PCI. Preferred route for the primary PCI. Uh, this was a big debate that the radial was better or the, um, the femoral was better, but trials uh, such as the rival trial, which came into 2011, came up with the idea that the right radial is, uh, is better in terms of major vascular complications. It decreases like uh, there was a more major vascular complications with the femoral. However, the newer trial in 2019 came up with the uh, with an idea that that was a safari STEMI trial that there was nothing to do with the radial or the femoral axis in the STEMI patients. However, safari there was no mortality benefit. Sorry. Mm. There was there was no mortality benefit with the uh, either radial over femoral or femoral over radial, so both were non-inferior. So additional consideration during the primary PCI or STEMI is very important, such as aspiration thrombectomy or treatment of the non-culprit or the culprit arteries, and the usage of uh, like mechanical circulatory devices. So there was a, a huge data. Uh, there was not a huge data, but we have a, a little data over aspiration thrombectomy. It was used to be uh, uh, think that uh, uh, there is a mortality benefit with the aspiration thrombectomy. However, the taste and total trial came up with, uh, 
completely different data. In 2015, a meta-analysis was done. It showed that there was a non-inferior PCA and the thrombectomy. Both were non, like if you are doing the PCA alone and thromb with thrombectomy, they both were the non-inferior. The primary outcome was same in both patients. However, the chances of the stroke and the, uh, the stroke was more in the thrombectomy group. That's why it was discouraged in the guidelines and the, the, which came up in the 2013. Uh, to, sorry, 2015, and initially it was class 2A, which now uh, then uh, made up to the class 3, and so routine aspiration is class 3 nowadays, and uh, you, yes, you can, if you want to do it, is class 2B. So complete versus com uh, culprit only revascularization is a big topic to discuss. There are so many trials which came up with the with an idea that you uh, we we should complete revascularization. Prami is one of them. 2013, it came up with an idea that uh, 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 when you are doing the uh, non culprit arteries who have the more than 50 percent of the stenosis, there would be a mortality benefit in those patients, and it decreases the like uh, major cardiovascular events. Uh, Dynami 3 prime multi uh, almost uh, showed the same results, but that trial was uh, done with the FFR guided complete revascularization in the STEMI patient, uh, which was compared to the infarct related only artery, and it again showed the major uh, risk and the major cardiovascular event was decreased in those patients who have done with the uh, uh, like uh, complete revesc uh, guided by the FFR. And there was another trial which uh, which came into the 2015 CV trial. It again showed that if you are doing the uh, non-infarct related arteries, then there would be uh, it, it it significantly lowered the rate of the composite primary endpoints, which was the major cardiovascular events, heart failure, and non-fatal MIs. There was another trial which recently came in 2019. That was a complete trial. This was done in the most of the centers in the Europe, and it came up with an idea that you should do the complete revascularization in those patients who are like the stable one. So it 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 showed the uh, uh, mortality benefit and uh, decreases the primary outcome as well as the secondary outcome, as you are appreciating here. That was that was a revolutionary trial. But there was another trial which which like uh, came into the 2018, the culprit shock trial. It it gave an uh, uh, like uh, amazing results that if you are doing the non culprit artery in the shock patients, like in the cardiogenic shock, then it increases the mortality. That's why uh, now uh, it it has been assumed that you do not. Uh, like it is not recommended to the uh, non-infarcted artery, non-culprit artery in the condition of cardiogenic shock. Uh, however, guideline says that it is class 2B indication. It was Initially, it was class 3 to do the non-culprit artery, but now it's class 2B if you are uh, interested to do the non-culprit artery in the STEMI patients. Now, the MCS devices in the STEMI, obviously, the IABP shock trial, which was which was a bit older trial, came into 2007 or probably 2012. Yes. And uh, it showed that the intra-aortic balloon pump in the myocardial infarction with cardiac shock has not shown any mortality benefit with co a comparison with those patients who haven't gone with the IABP. So uh, both were non-inferior. And that was another school of thought that Impella is better than the intraiotic balloon pump, which was negated in the PROTECT 2 trial, which showed that Impella is never better than the intraiotic balloon pump, but the both were non inferior and showed no mortality benefit over each other. There was the NST elevation MI, and obviously you know that as we have discussed the all primary PC and the strategies to do with the like like intervention. Now, if your patient is com coming to you with for the reperfusion and he, it, it, he or she needs immediate reperfusion, and you have done with the primary PC or you have exhausted this thing or such as if you uh, like if you haven't do this. Uh, and the fibrolytic is the op only option, then obviously you have to opt it, but. Uh, As you know that these are the prior IC bleed and intracular neoplasm, aneurysms, AV malformations, and all these. I'm not going to details of all these things. So uh, the usage of the P2Y12 inhibitor post PCI, uh, like post fibrolytic patients, the clarity TM28, the comet showed huge mortality benefit when you use the uh, like clopidogrel in those patients who have, have the post SK, uh, uh, who are post SK. So that is the reason the adjunctive antiplatelet therapy with Fibrinolysis is still indicated. The clopidogrel is the only indicated drug uh, according to the AHA guidelines. So if your if your patient is coming to you and you are planning to give the fibrinolysis, you have to load your patient with the 300. If your patient is elder than 65 years of age, then you need to skip the uh, loading dose. You have to give only 75 mg of the dose, and you have to continue with the 75 mg. But there was a school of thought. Still, the patients are practicing that they are giving the 
Tikigir uh, Lal. Uh, uh, post uh, fibrinolytics then this trial was came up in 2019 recent uh, recently it showed that free ticagrelol versus clopidogrel patient in STEMI who was treated with the fibrinolysis both showed nothing no, no one was superior to any other both were non inferior and showed no mortality benefit over each other that was the reason uh, so clopidogrel is a better drug to use with if you if you want to use the ticagrelol the tree trial gave you the permission to do this but there was uh, not any mortality benefit over each other <clears throat> excuse me so adjunctive anticoagulation with the fibrinolysis it is an important thing you know that thrombus needs anticoagulation if your patient has the thrombus in the cornea you have to anticoagulate it extract timi 25 was came up with an amazing idea that uh, inoxaprin uh, it was not it showed that inoxaprin was better than the unfractioned heparin. Why? Because unfractioned heparin increases the like death or non-fatal VMI by 30 days, and the secondary points were also more in the unfractioned heparin. So <clears throat> this was a revolutionary trial, which uh, which came up with an idea that the inoxaprin is better. So if you are uh, using the you know, anticoagulation in your patient with the uh, post SK, then it is better to use the <coughs> the uh, inoxaprin. Uh, that was. The trial, which came up in probably 2005 or 2006, and published in the European Society of Journal, but the guideline says that the all unfractioned heparin, noxaprin, and underfundaprinox, these all three are the class one indication. You can use them. Number two, uh, and the modern thing is that if you are using unfractioned, you have to keep the control of 1.5 to 2 times of that APTT and you have to continue it for the 48 hours, which is a bit difficult thing, but you can do this. Inoxaprin, but if you are opting the inoxaprin or fundaprinox, you have to give it like uh, up to the eight days or index hospitalizations. So what to do after fibrinolysis? Now, obviously you have the only two options. If your patient is, uh, is, is, is like completely asymptomatic and having nothing, then you have to do the stress test to show the, uh, like to look for the ischemia and the viability. However, <coughs> If your patient has been done with the uh, uh, fibrinolysis, then an another thing was to do the angiography. So transfer AMI, which was published in New England Journal in 2009, came up with, uh, with an idea that there was a mortality benefit, a huge mortality benefit with, the, with those who have done with the routine early PCI than those who, who only gone with the standard treatment. So uh, yes, guideline says that if you have to do the invasive strategy in all stable patients, though even they are stable, you have to ship them within, uh, you have to do the PCI within three to 24 hours, but you cannot do this less than three because then it would become a facilitated PCI and it, it would be obviously harmful for the patient. We will discuss later on. And number two is that if your patient is a signs of shock and the chest pain and all these things, then you have to do the uh, like uh, rescue PCI and the shift, and you can do the PCI even less than 33 hours. So, facilitated pharmacoinvasive PCI is an idea which came up that uh, uh, when you're doing uh, the patient's present to STEMI, like you can't do the angiography immediately, you have to do the like give the pharmacologic therapy half for full dose, then you have to shift your patient to the PCI for other therapies. Then the meta analysis done uh, uh, between the facilitated PCI versus primary PCI had showed that there was a four groups uh, who were giving the lytic alone, the 2B3 alone, or the lytic plus 2B3 and the all. It showed that in all groups, primary PCI was better than the facilitated PCI. That's why facilitated PCI becomes uh, became a, a, a class three indication. Then the rescue PCI came up uh, uh, like this was a trial, which which was known as the REACT trial. And uh, this came up with the idea of rescue PCI. It showed that there was a huge mortality benefit in those patients who had failed PCI or who had not resolution of symptoms or the ST elevations on their ECGs. So now the, uh, now the important topic of discussion is opening of the totally occluded artery in STEMI after 24 hours. The only one trial, which was a remarkable trial in the history. It's a bit older trial, which showed that there is nothing but benefit to open the artery when uh, you have passed the time more than 72 hours. So old trial, the patients were uh, divided into two groups, one who have the completely occluded artery and have passed on more than 72 hours. So the PCI group had more mortality than the medical therapy. So medical therapy has less primary endpoints and was better than the PCI group. That's why it is now class three to open the totally occluded artery if it, uh, 24 hours has been passed. However, you can open the artery if your patient is in the cardiac shock. Yet you do you can do the PCI in the, in, the, in those conditions if, if they have the 
like a non uh, uh, ischemia or non invasive testing and having the the ventricular arrhythmias or life threatening arrhythmias so wake up guys before uh, wake up otherwise i can do this pacemaker test lab with you guys so routine medical therapy in stemi uh, uh medical therapy uh, then an idea was that the usage of oxygen is better in the in the patients uh, if the sets are not if the sets are more than 94% then a white trial uh, told us to avoid oxygen in those patients who have the 94% of the sets or more than 95% of the sets the uh, there was a, an an other group uh, ices one trial which was done on the oral atenolol and it showed huge mortality benefit like more than 50% of the reduction in the vascular death uh, in atenolol group then obviously there was a trial which uh, which is very famous and the comet trial which showed that you can you have to use the uh, like uh, metoprolol but uh, the problem was that if you are using it into uh, like in the iv form then the placebo is better uh, placebo is better than the metoprolol uh, so when when they compared it uh, the, uh, the like the all trials uh, like there this was the uh, meta analysis of the studies miami ices and the comet trial it showed that uh, overall the beta blocker were better but the problem was that that the, if you are using it into uh, like uh, uh, this in the clip class 2 or 3 then they are like if if you are especially you are using in the class 3 so the placebo is far more better than the other conditions that was the reason that it was uh, contraindicated to use the active heart failure patients or having the low cardiac output or the cardiogenic shock so you can wait for the 24 hours and at every and every after 24 hours you have to reconsider your patient for the beta blocker because it is the class 1 and however these are these are few contraindications to usage of the beta blockers there was a uh, 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 the huge data on usage of the um, uh, ac inhibitor or aft the save air in the trace trial in which the ef was less than 40% there was a signs of heart failure and the echocardiography, echocardiography showed <coughs> excuse me less than 35% it showed there was a huge mortality benefit than the placebo if they used the ac inhibitor in those patients so uh, that's why it is class 1 to use the ac or aft in your patient uh in 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 the in the condition of your patient has the mi in the anterior location or in first 24 uh, you you have to use that uh, as well in first 24 hours and the, especially your ef uh, your patients ef is less than 40% and there was a trial which was done on the uh, uh, like aldosterone uh, uh, receptor antagonist which was efss trial was which was done on the aplerinone and showed again the mortality benefit than the placebo that <coughs> that is why this class 1 to use in those patients who have ef less than 40% and those who have either symptomatic heart failure or diabetes mellitus so if your patient is diabetic mellitus and no no symptoms even if it is class 1 then you have to give it if your patient has the post mi ejection fraction is for less than 45 40% so <coughs> so the secondary prevention in the long term management obviously after the uh, mi uh, uh, what you have to consult your patient for the smoking cessation the blood pressure control should be less than 140 however the recent guideline showed it is it should be 130 and the 80 the physical activity and the minimum goal should be 30 minutes till to 4 days per week I, uh, now or now it's become like uh, 150 uh, uh, if your patient is doing the brisk walk then you advise to it's uh, like 150 minutes in a week which can be divided into 3 to 4 days the, and obviously the control of diabetes because obviously the main culprit and the main problem is the diabetes because our more, more most of the 80% patients are diabetic in the in in an in acs in an acs so the weight management obviously is important because uh, you know that heart never learns that is the reason i need your brain here so please keep your brain with me to learn the acs now the non st acs uh that was the same condition as we discussed the stemi now we have to discuss the unstable angina in the non stemi as i discussed you that in a non stemi the unstable there would not be the st elevation mi as name shows number 2 is there would be subendocardial infarction that would not be the transvenous but that non stemi and unstable angina can be <coughs> can be converted or can be developed into the uh, into in, in, into stemi so there would be complete occlusion or nearly complete occlusion or the partial occlusion in the patients of non st acs 
you know that uh, they in the in the ACS, if you have the uh, leak biomarkers, you will label it as a non-STMI, and if uh, they are not, then you have to label it as unstable angina. So there was the ancient history to usage of the CKMD troponin, and the recent past year was a troponin. However, nowadays in the modern era, we have the high sensitivity troponin, which can diagnose or which can rule out and rule in patient within three hours. So there was a trial which came in uh, in 2019. It showed that the, with usage of the high sensitivity troponin, the, the that was a rapid TNT trial. It showed that there was early discharges from the emergency department. So it was better to use the high sensitivity troponin than the uh, your uh, 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 conventional drops. But the problem was that there was no mortality benefit uh, by using of either of it. That uh, so it is not compelling indication to use the high sensitivity troponin in any institution. Then obviously your patient is presenting to the ACS. You have to label and you have to divide your patient into the three categories: high, intermediate, or low. And obviously the low would be those who have the atypical chest pain. Neither there would be any ECG changes, nor they have any like uh, uh, the drops were leaked. So the, obviously those will be the low, uh, low likelihood of ACS, but you have, uh, and the second are the intermediate, which are the important one, because those are the like most confusing one, because most of the time the low would be negative and high would be positive. The problem would be with the intermediate. It can be positive and can be negative. So uh, they, they are sort of mixed patients, usually having diabetes mellitus, having left arm chest pain or typical or the atypical chest pain. Sometimes they would have the ECG changes and sometimes they would have this uh, uh, like leak drops and the high obviously there would be the typical chest pain there would be the signs might there would be the signs of the MR and this like the, uh, the heart failure and there would be the obvious ECG changes and the drops were leaked so in these conditions obviously you have to admit the patient but the most the threatening and the dangers are intermediate one so you have to calculate the TME score you have to do nothing in every ACS in every ACS the patient who is coming to you in ER you have to calculate the TME score there are few scores as well there are few more scores as well such as heart score and the grace score but the important thing uh, the the important are two the TME and the grace if you are like expect expecting an uh, ACS in your patient so if your obviously TME are more two or more than two, then you have to admit the patient and do it accordingly. And uh, you, uh, I, I know that you are well aware of all these parameters of the TME scoring. The anti-ischemic therapy, you know that you have to relieve the symptoms because it is more benefit such as GC3 or ISIS-4, but there were no mortality benefit in these trials. The beta blocker, you know that in acute MI trials, as we discussed earlier, decreases the ischemia and decreases the death and mortality in the MI in patients. But IV are not indicated, oral are better. And especially if the heart failure, the patient are risk of shock, then you do not need to uh, uh, consider it. The calcium channel blocker, morphine, oxygen are another modality. You have to use it accordingly because they cannot be routinely used in, in the patient of MI. These are the same things which we discussed earlier. Management of the strategy or in the non ST patient are obviously too invasive or medical one. So in most of the time you are in, uh, uh, you have to go for the invasive one. But how uh, how we will do this? We will discuss it later on. So you are and if your patient is coming to you, have to divide your patient into the four categories. The those who have gone who who, who should have uh, be uh, like who should go for immediate invasive and a few are uh, like uh, who should go for the early invasive delayed or the ischemia guided those patients who have the uh, refractory angina sign and symptoms worsening mr recurrent angina or life threatening uh, arrhythmias those should go for the immediate and invasive immediate invasive should be done within two hours it should not be done later than two hours because these are the patients who would benefited most from the uh, in, uh, invasive uh, therapy so the, 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 there was a second arm and the, there was a GRACE score, which was uh, if your patient has a GRACE score more than 140 and there was a temporal change in troponin, like the first drop was two and in the next drop uh, you would get is 20, then it is better to do the early invasive, which should be done with ideally within 24 hours. But the delayed invasive is something which you can do in within three days of the admission. Those are the patients who have the TME risk score more than two, but having the grace between one, 109 to 140 and having the issues with the CKD, the previous cabbages, cabbage was done, the early post infarction angina is there or the patient has the PCI or cabbage uh, uh, in previously. 
and now the last but not the least is ischemia guided arm which should be done uh, with uh, non invasive strategies ideally you have to go for the non invasive in these patients and if there uh, would be any uh, high risk findings uh, on non non invasive then you have to go for the <coughs> invasive strategies so here is a meta analysis of all trial which shows that all uh, in uh, non stemi uh, most of the trial favors the invasive strategy but the older trial such as the vanquish trial it uh, it favors the conservative strategy by, because it is a trial which was done in the 1980 probably in the military regimes and it was done on uh, uh, and in that era where the pci in the invasive strategy was not developed at uh, on that level So there was an other uh, uh, like uh, study which published in New England Journal in 2001 showed that that you can uh, decide uh, the uh, invasive strategy on the troponin levels as well. If your patient has a temporal change of the troponins, then invasive strategy is always better than the conservative strategy as you are appreciating here. So when I was scared, I thought hard looked like this when I. And then one day, teacher drew this diagram. However, when I came <laughs> cardiologist, and I knew that uh, this is not the heart, but this is the heart which we are discussing right now. So the antithrombotic, antiplatelets. You have to start with the COX inhibitor as we discussed. You have to give the P two I twelve inhibitor as we discussed, and anticoagulant. Again, the infraction, low molecular, and the DTIs are uh, some of like uh, anticoagulant. You have to use it uh, in the patients. This is the same diagram which we discussed. Like, previously clopidogrel this uh, there's a, a in the non st there was the positive data which was the cure uh, in the non st patient and again it showed there was a mortality benefit while using the clopidogrel than the placebo so it is class 1 to use the clopidogrel in the patient the trenton timi as we, which we discussed previously again showed the mortality benefit in the procedural arm than the clopidogrel who have gone through the pcis <clears throat> not conservative So in the and uh, the plateau trial again showed the same that ticagrelor was superior to the clopidogrel in the non stemi as well but the bleeding was the obviously the uh, was was more in the ticagrelor especially the uh, non cabbage related bleeding so the clopidogrel presuteral and the ticagrelor all are class 1 however the if you are preferring tica or presu over clopid it is class 2a So uh, GP2B3 inhibitors is a but dif bit different story with the uh, 2B3A inhibitors in the in the uh, non-STEMI. You can use the uh, GP2B3A non-STEMI who have like uh, not at the table of uh, CAT but uh, outside the CAT who have planned for the uh, early invasive strategies but are uh, waiting uh, for the CAT labs. However, in the STEMI patient, you cannot use uh, 2B3A inhibitors uh, like uh, the before the patient shifted to the CAT labs. so anticoagulants obviously in acu uh, acutely you have uh, three options the unfraction low molecular weight and the bilirubin and these all are the class 1 the fundaprenox is class 1 as well and uh, plateau trial trintron timi trial they all uh, shown this that these are superior to the clopidogrel there was a trial uh, there was a, there was an a, there was a question that should we use ticagrelor beyond one year or not then the pegasus timi 54 came up with with an answer that yes uh, they they followed the patient and it showed the mortality benefit in patient up to the 33 months like more than or almost more than 3 years so it 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 shows that uh, uh, you can use it ticagrelor in your long term in your patients prove it to me which came up with an idea of using of the torvay statin atmg to decrease your ldl cholesterol more than 50% and obviously ac inhibitor and all acute mi there was the isis4 trial of on which was done on the cap captopril and it showed there was a mortality benefit but here here is some amazing data that if your patient having the no st depression then the placebo is better that is the reason if your patient has no diabetes hypertension and uh, low ejection fraction then it is better not to give the uh, beta uh, like it is class 2 b to give the ac inhibitor in those patient if your patient has its non stemi and having all these things then it is better to give the uh, ac inhibitor so this was the uh, data came from this isis4 trial there was obviously as you discussed that aldosterone antagonist that was the fss trial we discussed already uh, previous in the previously in stemi now uh, the, this is a summary you have to diagnose it using 
like uh, likelihood and the toll edc and the troponin you have to select the, uh, either your patient should go for the uh, invasive or conservative strategy then you have to give the anti ischemic treatment anti platelet treatment select anticoagulant and uh, there were obviously then would be the long term therapy which we discussed right now so don't break anybody's heart they have only one break their bones they have 206 so please listen to me otherwise i will break your bones <laughs> special consideration this is this is like uh, at most important topics for especially for exams point of view and uh, that the crusade bleeding should be calculated in all acs patient who have gone through for more uh, two or three antiplatelet or having uh, like uh, uh, one or two anticoagulation for it, it 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 calculates the bleeding score so if you uh, so you have to just add on 10 into every uh, stage and your, your stage becomes from very low to low low to moderate and high and to very high so this was the timi scoring of this timi which is not important for uh, for the guidance of treatment however it would guide you for the 30 day mortality in the prognosis of patient so you can guide your attend uh, the patient uh, patient and uh, and his or her attendants about the outcome of the primary pca or outcome of this timi or the prognosis of, uh, about uh, about your patient this is uh, an other risk scoring which is the grace and obviously it is again very important why it is important because it tells you the in the hospital mortality as well as the post discharge 6 months mortality so there are few things added uh, um, uh, there are few things which are not in the timi scoring such as the uh, cardiac arrest ad admission the creatinine <clears throat> these are things these are the things which are not in the uh, timi scoring so again grace scoring is, is is something which you which you tells you the mortality in post hospital and the in hospital now the important thing is that dapt and the doex or the triple therapy in afib or the pci patient if your patient has afib and you have done with the pci with test so the very newer data came up in 2019 so uh, i have drawn this picture because i didn't get any thing to do this and i was short of time as i am post call from ccu so this is the dapt and the doex in the af patient the reference is to esc guidelines and up to date so uh, you have to divide your patient into four categories high thrombotic high bleeding risk high thrombotic low bleeding risk low thrombotic high bleeding risk or low thrombotic or low bleeding risk the risk should be calculated through the chadwick score or the hasbred score or the crusade score if your patient has the high chadwick score and the high timi and the grace score if your patient has high uh, crusade and the hasbred score so it means that your patient has the high thrombosis and the high bleeding risk so if your patient is a low thrombotic and high bleeding risk so if your patient has the low timi score or the low grace score or if you have as like chadwick score is two or it is not more than two <clears throat> then and if your patient uh, along with that your patient has the high bleeding risk such as the having high crusade and all these things then it is better to give the aspirin for two weeks and then you have to continue clopidogrel plus doex for 12 months okay so if your patient is low thrombotic risk then it is you you can give aspirin only for two weeks like only for 14 days and you have to continue with your patient the clopidogrel and the doex for rest of the 12 months then uh, after 12 months you can continue only doex so uh, it is according to the esc guideline up to date but if your patient has the low thrombotic and low bleeding your now your patient has low thrombotic as well as the low bleeding now you are not very much like uh, uh, cautious for the bleeding <coughs> then it is <coughs> excuse me it is better to give aspirin and plus clopi for one month for whole of one month then uh, and the doex like you have to give triple therapy in this condition for 14 days only but here you have to continue the triple therapy for one month and after one month for 11 months you have to continue the clopi and doex and obviously after 11 month when clopi has done with its job you can continue aspirin plus doex if your patient is low thrombotic and the low bleeding risk you can continue doex only as well now you if your patient has high thrombotic high bleeding you have to continue the same thing over here and if your patient is high thrombotic low bleeding risk you can continue the same thing i have drawn this picture just make this simpler for you guys that if you re uh, remember this thing so all these things would be covered so in exams if you write this thing that i would continue aspirin and clopidogrel plus doex and then i will continue the clopi and the doex for 11 months so your question will be correct why because here here aspirin is 2 weeks if you can continue the aspirin 2 weeks more then it is it is it is not bad to continue with it however in the, in those condition there when there is a high thrombotic risk 
and low bleeding risk you can continue triple therapy for 6 months okay you can continue uh, uh, according to the up to date but i would suggest you guys to remember this thing so augustus trial uh, which uh, which was done on the apexaban and it is very important to uh, read the augustus trial why because uh, apexaban recently came here uh, in pakistan <clears throat> and it, uh, it was a trial which was comparison of four groups in which the apexaban vitamin uh, apexaban was given alone vitamin k was given alone aspirin was given alone and aspirin maize placebo was given it shows that apexaban was superior to all of these <coughs> in terms of primary and the secondary outcomes there was another trial which was done on the rivaroxaban that was a pine day for pci trial it again uh, shows that uh, rivaroxaban was superior to the vitamin k antagonist and uh, and the Thing. it shows that you have to decrease the dose of rivaroxaban in that condition you have to decrease the dose of uh, rivaroxaban from 20 mg to 15 mg so if you are giving rivaroxaban in triple therapy you have to give the dose of rivaroxaban 15 mg with other agents okay so redual trial came up with the uh, approval of dabigatran with the same strategy with the same signs now there was another trial uh, on uh, adexaban that was the interest trial i forgot to uh, put the slide of that trial you have to but i am telling you to go through that slide switching of the p2y12 mr it is very 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 important concept if you have uh, started your patient the clopidogrel and uh, uh, or, or any other uh, antiplatelet now you are switching like uh, if i have started the clopidogrel on one patient and uh, on second day or after discharge or at the time of this or like at the time of uh, discharge my patient is asking to change uh, its medication like clopidogrel uh, to ticagrelor how would i change so this is these slides are answer to that question so uh, we have two settings in the switching number one is the acute setting acute setting is in hospital setting in hospital setting it means that you have started your patient clopidogrel and now you are uh, like and now you are switching uh, an other platy uh, antiplatelet so if you have started as we do in an icbd like we we give clopidogrel to our patient and then we switch to the ticagrelor or so the if you have to if you are giving clopidogrel so the the important thing in acute in acute setting to remember that in with the clopidogrel you do not wait and you do not wait okay otherwise in acute setting you have to load <clears throat> so you just remember one thing in acute setting that you do not wait with clopidogrel and the rest of the things are same so see that if your clopidogrel you do, you do not wait and give the ticagrelor and presu and you have to load it because it is a acute setting in acute setting you have to load so if you are switching the ticagrelor you have to wait as i told you 24 hours and the presu you have to wait for 24 hours so you have to wait in acute setting but not in clopidogrel however in acute setting you have to load in any condition if you are switching from clopi to tica to presu and from tica to clopi to presu and presu from tica to clopi so the important thing and the take home message of that slide of that lesson is that you do not wait in acute setting and give the loading dose in clop uh, and you do not wait in the clopidogrel and you will load in acute setting okay so in clopidogrel you will not wait and load the patient and uh, with 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 any drug home you are keeping him <clears throat> now switching of p2y12 in chronic setting or uh, now the important one thing is that the only data which is available is is uh, on ticagrelor and clopi the switching from clopi to ticagrelor otherwise uh, there are very weak or almost no data over over other uh, over other conditions and uh, these are things not in guidelines as well these are the trials and a uh, uh, few small circulation papers on, uh, in aha and esc so switching of the p2y in the chronic setting what is the chronic setting if you have discharged your patient and now you are uh, switching in the opd so keep one thing in your mind that in every like in in chronic setting you will not load you will not load in acute setting you were loading and in chronic setting you will not load but only in ticagrelor but only in ticagrelor so in ticagrelor obviously you have wait but you have to load with clopi and the presu in the presu you have to wait but no loading clopi you have to wait but no loading so it is very easy uh, why i am repeating again and again it is a newer thing and usually examiners ask these things that acute setting you have to wait 
and load in clopidogrel otherwise you have to load only but uh, 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 in clopidogrel you will not wait and load and in rest of the condition you have to wait and load and here you have to wait in all condition all condition but you will load only in tikka if you are if you are patient on tikka then you have to load otherwise you will not load so transient stemi which used to be called as a ab aborted stemi so there is nothing abortions like abortion is something very uh, a discussing topic in <coughs> gynae and off but we don't have these abortions but the transient stemi what is the transient stemi if your patient has symptoms and st elevation mi and while shifting or while the next hour or the while waiting for the primary pci your patient has settled the <coughs> st elevation mi <coughs> and the ecg changes then this transient trial which came into 2019 it it it, it came up an idea that among patient of the transient stemi immediate invasive therapy was not superior to the delayed invasive so you can wait uh, for for 72 hours okay so you you uh, 24 to uh, 72 hours so uh, it is it is not uh, like any an emergency to go for the uh, invasive strategy in those patient but uh, obviously if you have one cath lab and one patient is present uh, pre uh, is, uh, is there with the anterior lmi and it it has become the transient mi and another is with the inferior lmi so you have to take that in acute inferior lmi rather than the transient mi so anemia in acs is a big topic and this is again the very newer trial 2020 came up that reality trial it showed that we uh, initially it was uh, uh, it, it was a school of thought that your patient has less than 10 ka hemoglobin you have to uh transfuse it but a reality trial showed that if uh, if you are using the uh, like a uh, 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 strict strategy uh, like a restrictive strategy for transfusion versus the liberal strategy of the transfusion uh, then uh, both were non inferior so if you even your patient has hemoglobin less than 8 if you are not tra transfusing uh, if you are transfusing him over the hemoglobin of less than 8 and an another arm they were transfusing the hemoglobin of less than 10 both were non inferior so you can wait up to 10 8 hemoglobin but less than 8 uh, you have to transfuse post mi depression is one of the important topic to discuss why because you know that with depression post mi depression the mortality increases more than 23% so the, there was a very old trial which came in around uh, i think a 2005 or 6 and th that was the sedart trial it it showed the uh, and it approved the drug certainly it 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 showed the safety data that's why most of the time sertraline has been used in the post mi depressions post mi defib you know that those patients who are <coughs> excuse me uh, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy i am having the ejection fraction of less than 40% those are the high risk for the sudden cardiac death so there was a trial west trial which came in 2018 showed no mortality benefit uh, because uh, those were the patient in which we usually wait for 90 days uh, post uh, mi uh, after revascularization and without revascularization we have to wait for the 40 days so in those patients were like uh, kept on uh, variable cardiofibrillar defibrillator and it showed no benefit so that is the reason no need to practice this variable cardioventricular defibrillator thirds uh, <coughs> in those patients difference between sin and the cholesterol embolization this is the last topic i just added uh, because most of the time in your examination people ask you about the sin and the cholesterol embolization and they ask you about the difference because in both of the patients cred d range post pci cred d range and patient has the like uh, more or less problems would be same in these patients so in sin the cred worsens within 24 to 48 hours then you have to think about the sin okay and the pathogenesis is atn it is the uh, acute tubular necrosis the risk factors are diabetes nephrotoxic drugs ckd age and usually less aggressive disease uh, and recovers usually it is the less aggressive disease it is not uh, that aggressive than the cholesterol embolization and the differential diagnosis of sin is like cholesterol embolization acute interstitial nephritis secondary to drugs which you are giving a post pci patient pre renal due to the diuretics as you know that patient coming uh, to us with the acute pulmonary edema in the stemi in the acs condition we we diurese them very liberally so the management is fluid and stop the nephrotoxic drug it has not embolic lesions eosinophilia and decreased complement this is the differentiating point 
here that those patients would not have the embolic lesions okay on the peripheries that and it, there would be not eosinophilia and the complement levels will not be decreased however in the cholesterol embolization crate worsens usually most of the time after 40 after 48 hours the in in in, in these conditions crate does not worsen uh, less than 48 hours pathogenesis is uh, obviously uh, the, the same as the embolic lesions the cholesterol uh, embolizes uh, dislodges and goes into the arteries and causes the embolic uh, Uh, like uh, ischemia such as the digital ischemia levodopa reticular eosinophilia these all are the uh, signs and the findings in the cholesterol embolization usually diagnosis requires biopsy so uh, whenever they ask you about this such scenario you have to you have to write the biopsy in the management usually uh, kidney function never or little recovers okay so the prognosis of the cholesterol embolization is not not that good than the sin and the management is risk factor management you have to give aspirin initiate the or you have to control the bp you have to stop the smoking you have to counsel them for the cessation of smoking you have to control the diabetes bp control you have to give the anti thrombotic therapy anti coagulation but if your patient need hemodialysis you have to keep your patient on the hemodialysis and revest if needed if your patient is acute limb ischemia secondary to cholesterol embolization you have treat it accordingly okay and the prognosis is very poor and in, in hospital mortality is 16% so if your patient has cholesterol embolization secondary to pci your patient has a mortality of 16% thanks this is all about uh so if you need to ask any question i am here thank you dr navid for such a detailed and comprehensive review your 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 voice is very low uh can you hear me now yeah yeah ha okay. thank thank you so much for such a detailed uh, and quick review on acf in just 45 minutes uh, we'll be hmm. taking the questions in the end from dr zahid jamal okay himself. Fine. So just wanted to inform everyone that we had a little glitch that we weren't expecting this many participants so we have created a new link uh we'll be sharing them in the group you can rejoin using that link so the maximum capacity problem that people have been facing resolves okay so we'll take the next lecture there we'll start in 2 minutes please join using the new link i'll be sharing the link in the groups now okay so we have to uh, log out from this ha ah, you can just uh, leave this meeting and you can rejoin the next one the link i'm sharing okay